so alluring. The Rovers Chat YouTube channel is proudly sponsored by SixYardsOut.com. They've got retro football from every era with mugs, phone cases and much more. They also have plenty of Rovers goods including apparel with the famous 94-95 season and this season's kit. Check them out using the link in the description below. Um, I'm here with someone that I'm sure a lot of you will be very familiar with. He was a player at Blackburn during the early 80s and into mid 80s but he's also had a, a fantastic career at Preston at Everton you know playing and also in the non-playing roles and mm-hmm. um, I'm sure many of you will have read his book as well which is a, a short list is on the William Hill book of the year sports book of the year in 2011 so let us you know after that fantastic build-up let's let everybody down by telling who it actually is yeah. <laughs> um, it's Mick Rathbone how are you Mick? Oh, I'm fantastic. Thank you very much, mate. Yeah, I'm still in the game. Um, 62 next month, but lucky, to, uh, you know, if you can work in the game from when you're 16 to 62, you've been very fortunate. Yeah, I did have an ambition a few years ago of working for every single club in the country. Right. I've given up on that now. I've done about 15 of the bloody things like, you know, so I've had such a varied, exciting, interesting career. At the moment, I'm head of rehab, I think it's called, or rehab manager at the uh, Academy at Everton, the under-23s I work with specifically. So, it's, mate, my cup runner, I've been so lucky, mate, I, I can't tell you. I will yeah. try and tell you, though. You're going to try and tell us, hopefully, because if that would have been a very short podcast, should we, should we end it there? One minute and 20 <laughs> uh, so you do still run into Blackburn then, I suppose, because we, Everton and Blackburn, will come in contact quite often in the, mm-hmm. in the academy mm-hmm. stuff. You know, I've come to the conclusion that if you stay in the game long enough, you do end up knowing nearly everybody. And it was really interesting because last Saturday, was it, uh, Rovers under-18s played Everton's under-18s down at Finch Farm. I went in early to watch a game. Billy Barr's there. Billy Barr was my skipper at Halifax when I was a manager. He's in it. <laughs> He's actually cost me my job. I do remind him when I see him. Yeah. So Billy Barr's there. Also a lad called Ryan Kidd, who, who's with Blackburn now. He was a young uh, uh, central defender when I was a physio at Preston. Also in the same dugout, there's Josh O'Keefe, who's just gone as the under-18 physio. I played with his dad at Birmingham for many years and at Blackburn. It's yes. sat kind of wheels within wheels. And as I say, if you stay in the game long enough and work uh, as many clubs as I've uh, done, you do almost get to know somebody at every single club. Yeah, it's a good family, though, to be part of, isn't it? And as you yeah. said already, you couldn't ask for for kind of better for being in the game for as long as you have been. So take us back to that 16-year-old kid. Um, was it always your dream to actually be involved in football or were you really just found that you were good at it and fell into it? It was different back then. We're talking about the mid-70s. There was no academies, there was no conveyor belt that you were on from eight till you got pushed off at 10, 11, 12, 13, like 99% of kids nowadays. I went to a grammar school in Birmingham. I was a good runner, rugby, football, highly academic, I've got to say. Wanted to be a doctor, dreamed of being a footballer, but it was only a dream because of the structure. So played for my school, then selected to play for Birmingham schools. I was captain of Birmingham schools. Captain of Warwickshire schools. In those days, Birmingham was in Warwickshire, like Manchester was in Lancashire, and Liverpool was in Lancashire. Okay. Captain those. Um, and then it's only sort of 15 and 16, the club say to my dad, Mr. Rathbone, we'd like to sign your lad as an apprentice. So then the magic starts kind of later on with, and with a lot more impact. So you've not got this kind of, as I said before, this process of being eight, nine, ten. And then by the time you're 12, nearly everyone's been told no. It wasn't like that. And the games were much more for the enjoyment. There was no pressure. You didn't feel under pressure to play. You dreamed of being a footballer, but there was no imperative. There's no pressure on you to get another two years at the academy. There was none of that stuff. And then I say, I begged my dad on the headmaster to let me leave school. No A-levels, straight to Birmingham. And in them days, there was no education programme, rightly or wrongly. You know, the, the different opinions on that. I went straight to Birmingham. But the point was, Andy, because... I'd kind of gone in, like everybody else, as a 16-year-old. When you walk into the club you support on that day, I don't know, 1st of July, 1st of August, 1975, and see all the players, the pictures of you have on the wall at home, I cannot tell you, it's magical. 
it's magical. And I think the young lads are denied that somewhat nowadays because they have this kind of slow process. I'm not saying it's producing better or worse players, but it's certainly put a lot more pressure on young players. So I walked into Birmingham City's training ground, which was by Birmingham Airport, by where I was born, and it was magic from day one. And there's Trevor Francis, there's Howard Kendall, there's Kenny Burns, there's all those, Gordon Taylor, play for both clubs. There's mm. all those legendary players. And I, yeah, I'm only getting £16 a week, you know, but I'm a professional footballer and I'm washing the kit and cleaning the boots and training every day. So I've got what the kids don't have now. I've got that magic. I've gone from school to playing football for a living. There's not been eight years of build-up and excitement and pressure and tension. A different era. Did really well. The first year was magical. Got in the first team when I was really young, 17. I made my debut at Spurs. Funny thing, as you said, when you're a kid, you dream of playing. But when you get there and you see... Listen, Andy, I've been on the terraces. I'd heard the booing and the pressure and the the negativity and how much stick the players got. I'd stood there with the fans and that. And, you know, it scared me, Andy. It frightened me. Uh, I wasn't booing the players myself. But when I got on the first team, I really struggled. And I remember playing in my debut at White Hart Lane. I was 17. I was on the bench. And I'm telling you, mate, I was praying not to get on that pitch. Yeah. And I was sat with a head in my hands. And I was counting backwards from 5,400 which is not easy to do, so the game would finish. I was doing really well. I got to about 300. I'm my head in my hands. And then the left back for Birmingham, a guy called Archie Stiles, he hobbled over to the dugout and he launched my career with the famous words, my groin's gone, get that C-U-N-T on. Uh, so oh, I, looked, I looked to my right, Willie Bell, the manager. I looked to my left. Andy Williams, a physio. There's three of us in the dugout. Mm. There's 23 today. There's, so I look up and this <laughs> one's for me. This yeah. one's for me. So <laughs> There's not much chase there. I think he's talking Nobody about you. Else, mate. This is for you, pal. You're on. I think I had about 315 seconds to go. Anyway, went on. Did okay. Stayed in the team. Played at Newcastle Saturday. Then got in the team. Did okay at first. Struggled really, really badly. Got a lot of stick off the supporters. A lot of bad press. Too young, too sensitive, too near to home in many ways and that. Mm. And the worst thing about it, you know, that's your kind of club. That's your fans booing you like, you know. Mm. And you know what the fans are like, Andy? They say, hey, we pay your wages, we'll boo if we want. Yeah. I said, yeah, but you're my parents, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's always much more difficult, you know, a prophet's hating his hometown. So I had a couple of horrible years really didn't want to play, would have loved a serious injury. I was unlucky with injuries, <laughs> mate. I was unlucky no, with injuries. Nobody did that for you, no. No one took you down in training for no, your own benefit. I wore my pads. I fly into the tackles. Never got, I was really unlucky with injuries. Never got one. So I had three horrific years of gradually losing all my confidence. Yeah. <laughs> Can I just stop you there. for a second? I, just because yeah. um, you talk about your own fans there and and the difficulty that you had with them. I spoke to Jason Wilcox um, not too long ago, a few months ago, obviously celebrating the title win. Um, but he, he he spoke a lot about his relationship with the Blackburn fans, and this would have been, I suppose, just after you left the club. Yeah. And when he Early came not. through. But he had a very difficult relationship with the fans, and he said that he took it very personally, but then he made it a challenge between himself and the supporters. And every yeah. time they booed him, he would do something and then turn around and go, that's what I can do. But yeah. you, you felt differently to that? Did you kind of let it weigh on you more? I was a lot younger than Jason. I saw him not so long ago. He's doing really well at Man City, isn't he? Yeah. Like I've seen him a couple of times recently. In fact, the last time I did a talk at the um, at St George's Park, he was in the audience, like you know. So um, I went on to mate, and I hated it. And I used to—I'll never forget this as long as I live. I stood in the corner at St Andrews. You come out in the corner and you walk up to the halfway line under cover, and then come out into the light. And I remember standing there <coughs> as an eighteen-year-old, probably thirty odd thousand on who hated me as a player. And I remember standing there <coughs> and thinking to myself, I couldn't feel any worse if I was getting hanged. Mm. Honestly, I couldn't imagine, if I was going there to be hanged, I couldn't imagine feeling any worse than I do right now. And it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I know I'm going to make a mistake. I know I'm going to play bad. 
I know I'm going to give the ball away. I know the fans are going to go mad. And you can't get out of that mindset. I remember once I was sub at home to Leicester, big local derby. Only one sub in them days. We were winning 1-0 at St Andrews. I thought, right, I don't want to go on. I'm counting down, bound to about 400, counting down again with one eye closed. And I'm thinking, if I go on, I know I'll make a mistake that will lead to the equaliser. When I made a mistake, led to the equaliser, the power of catastrophic thinking. So I had three terrible, awful years, what should have been magical years. Mm. It got to the point when Jim Smith was the manager, somebody else would manage both clubs. Yeah. I didn't want to play football anymore. I just wanted to leave. I needed out. I was gone. I'd gone from being an England youth international, debut at 17, really good cross-country runner. Really, I'd gone to that from that to being a shell, and I just wanted to get out and get any kind of job, anything. I don't care. I've just got to get out of this. And we played at Liverpool or Bolton, had a stinker. And on the Monday morning, we had another meeting with Jim Smith and he was going mad. And a guy called Joe Gallagher, the captain, got up and Jim Smith said, Joe's going to say a few words. And Joe ripped into all the young players. And I'll never forget it. It was in the 70s, but it was like it was yesterday. And he went through all the young players. He said, Mick Rathbone, he said, you think you're great, but you're S-H-I-T. And he was actually wrong there because I thought I was shit as well, to be fair. <laughs> so he, he got that wrong, Joe. And then he said, and Jim Smith got up and went, thanks, Joe, that needed saying. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Joe. I'm, I'm, thanks, I'm on Joe. the floor already. Thanks, I'm on the Joe. floor already. So you, 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 I'm on the floor and I want to get out and I can't sleep. And you've got up and killed me as well. And then Jim Smith got up and he said, <laughs> and I can laugh at this now. <laughs> you know that rhetorical phrase managers say, right, get out and get warmed up. And if any of you like, don't want to play against Man U on Saturday, stay behind and tell me. I thought, right, you asked for this, mate. So everybody trooped out and I stayed sat there. I was only maybe 19 by this time. And he said, what, what are you doing? I said, well, you, you know, you said if you don't want to play, stay behind and tell you. I said, I never want to play football again as long as I live. Mm-hmm. And you know what? He used to go mad at the players. Jim he used to go crazy. He was fantastic. He said, all right, son. He said, I get it. I can see you struggling. I'm going to have a week off. But don't do anything hasty. I'll get you on loan. I'll get you on loan somewhere. And we'll try and rebuild your career and your confidence. He saved my life that day in footballing terms. I went home. Uh, I still just wanted to get a job or no job. or just I didn't ever want to put a football boot on again. I think about a week later, he phoned me up. He said, right, he said, you can go to on loan. It was March 79. <coughs> you can go on loan to a club called Blackburn Rovers. I were not even bothered. I didn't want to go. I just didn't want to play football again. He said, do it. You'll enjoy it. The good people up there. That was March 1979. I got on the train from Preston, six pound the ticket. Really, <laughs> 156 pound. It was six quid the ticket. Straight up to Preston. Uh, John, John. Oh my God. Pickering. Yeah, yeah. I was talking about John Peacock. Tell the man. John Pickering met me at Preston Station. We drove through the Blackburn. He stopped me in the Woodlands, which is a hot. Two hundred yards from where I live now. He said, "John Bailey's coming around later to take you out for a drink," which he did. <laughs> Um, and, and, and that was it I was in Blackburn and you know the funny thing about it was I'd come from being kind of hated and felt like a crap player who was crap and everybody thought I was rubbish and that coming through the ranks no value no value that I felt in myself and I felt they didn't value me I was just rubbish and I'd gone to rubbish I was a rubbish footballer but that very first night it was a Thursday night in March I thought oh I'll go for a walk and I walked up Revage Road, you know it. I walked up yeah. Revage Road to a little Westview pub. It's not even there now. And I went in the pub. I thought I'd have a couple of pints, which was common practice in them days on a Thursday night when you were 19. I went in there and there was a newspaper, the Evening Telegraph, open on the pool table. And on the back, there was a big picture of me. And there was quite a big piece about me. And I would forgot that I had played for England. And I did make my debut in the Premier League at 17. I forgot that I was actually somebody. I had some worth in that. And then some people came over who must have recognised me and said, do you want a, a drink? And I got them a drink and they got my autograph. And it was a whole new feeling for me, Andy, because I'd become sort of desensitised to it all and I was rubbish and the rubbish rag and not worthy of anything. And all of a sudden, by getting a train 120 mile north or, and walking up to this little tiny pub and having my first pint with Thwaites yeah, mix in them days, probably about 25p, um, <laughs> all of a sudden... There's a picture of me and I'm a somebody because I've played for England and I've played in the top division and I'm only 19 or maybe 20. And people come over and 
they were nice to me. That they they weren't shouting, you 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 you're a wanker, you know. <laughs> Not at that stage, anyway. <laughs> so that came later. You know, Andy. All of a sudden, that feel good factor that I hadn't had probably since I was seventeen at the club. Mm. I went training the next day. Bales, John Bailey picked me up in his uh, R Edge Capri, and we, we went to Ewood Park, and it was lovely. And I got a guy called um, Oh my God, Alan, Alan. Oh my God, he's at Leicester now. He he played for Chelsea and Birchnell. Oh, yeah, Alan Birch was rooming with me as well. He was like, oh, this was my dad in them days. And we went in and he introduced me to the players and the players were excited to see me because I'd come from a higher level. And he walked in and he goes, this is Mick Rathbone. We're going to call him Basil. And it <laughs> yeah. stuck. And even, you know what? Even giving me my new name, my new nom de guerre, that mm. cast off the old Mickey Rath, Mickey Rath. So I went to new players with kudos, with good credentials, a whole new name, a whole new start. Mm. And I never looked back, mate. Mm. And, you know, I've said it many times and that Blackburn Rovers saved my career. It saved my self-esteem. So that club's more to me than somewhere to just run up down Ewood Park and bang a few balls in <laughs> into the Blackburn end, usually. It was more mm. than that. It was a catharsis to me. I met my wife up here and I live here now. So Blackburn is more than just a football club. It's my life. It's kind of a massive part of what I became and my DNA and that. And if Jim Smith hadn't been so reasonable, and if I hadn't have said yes to going up there, and if Birch hadn't drove me in that day and said, we're going to call him Baz. If I hadn't gone to the West View and all of a sudden felt the old self-esteem and the picture on the back of the paper and the autographs, all them things kind of rebuilt me because I was broken, mate. I was shattered in that. And that was the very first kind of keystone of my foundation that went in and yeah. made me, I, I dare say, what I am today and, and, and not scared of anything, any, not scared of anything. Wow, what a guy. <laughs> Look at you. Blackburn is more than any football club could ever be. To, it was my salvation. Like it was my, uh, I don't know, my church, I suppose, if you want to go into that level. So there you go. To so answer you, that question. So 25 that's, that's ago. Question, yeah. um, you mentioned about going on uh, Westview there. You didn't do the whole Revage run as well, did you? You know what? That's, I could do that now. There's only four pubs. You should be well, 30. you could do it now. Yeah, but back there, I think there was probably about 10 or 12, wasn't there? On the Yeah, way right up. down to the um, the one at Wiltshire, where my daughter lives, right down then on Nolsey Road. That, that was mm-hmm. The last one was the one at uh, the Rising, Brown Hill, Rising Sun, Falls Head, which is now co-op, and then yeah. the last one was the uh, Wiltshire Hotel. Wiltshire Hotel. That's the last one. Oh. Yeah. All gone now. No, I know, but you you kind of mentioned about doing that, and you can do the Revage run or or whatever. You talk a little bit about, you know, your relationship with drink and food around that time. Would you say you had a good relationship with that, or was that all part of you feeling quite broken inside? And as a young man, no, no. is that something different? I, I came in March. I played every game that season. It was unbelievable. To, to, to shout for the ball, to want the ball to come, to, to expect to so pass. Was that, the pro, was that the promotion season from the third division? Or was that no, the second? that was the year we went down. Down, now, yeah, the second division. Oh, OK, it's easier for me. I've dropped down a level. Instead of 30,000 on, there's 10,000 on. You're on loan, so you're not kind of fully signed up. So there's a lot less pressure. Mm. But I wanted to play, and I played well, and I felt like a proper player again. And that Because I've become a shell at Birmingham. At the end of that season, I moved out of the woodlands and I got my own digs. And a little lad called Russell Coughlin, God rest his soul, he moved in with me. And then me and Russell, like a couple of immature, he was probably only 19, I was 20. We started going out and it, it's really funny. I've just driven past the farthings. I've not mm. been in that pub probably for about 40 years. And me and Russ used to, like a lot of players, but me and Russ used to go out drinking all the time. Like a lot of players, but we took it to ridiculous levels because we were stupid and immature and that, like, you know. And how can there was a manager by this time? And God bless Russ. Russ would say, How are you, Bass? Come on, man. Let's go. No, it's a Northeastern accent. Come on, Bass. Me and you now. Let's go down the pub. God, that's, that's an Indian <laughs> accent. This is how it's wild. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm not familiar with that accent. <laughs> here, but, yeah. he's, mate, he's from Swansea. Great. Come on, boy. Me and you now down the pub. So. I said, Ross, we've got a game tomorrow. I said, come on up, man. <laughs> no, you know so we go in the pub and 
we go in, and I'd always go to the jukebox and put uh, Sad Cafe number one. I saw the lamplight from a window. I'd put that on, then Russ would go up to the bar. I'd go and sit down. Russ would come back, carrying six points. Mm. I say, Russ, we've got a game to go. We've got a game tomorrow. He says, I know, he said. I'm doing what Kendall said. He said, save your legs. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, we, Andy, we, we, we'd sit there and have some beer, like, you know. And then we'd walk up to the, um, there was a chippy at the top of the road. And uh, there was a spa. And Russ was heavy. What a player. But he was heavy. <laughs> he, he was heavy like so. We go in the fish and chip shop, and he'd have steak pudding, chips, peas, gravy in a tray. He go next door to spa, buy an uncut loaf, bare hand out the middle, <laughs> pour the contents in. He called it the full mug. Uh, and then just before he took a mouthful of what must be about four thousand calories, he goes, "Blas, he goes, phone Howard up, will you?" And tell him the diet starts tomorrow. <laughs> and if you consume that, Christ. We were str- we couldn't hardly perform. Me and Russ, like you know, we got dropped out of the team, and we, we were poor professionals and that. Fortunately, a few months down the line, I, I met my girlfriend, who's now my wife, for forty years. Next month and that, I went to live with her. Russ sorted himself out. I think he went down to Swansea to play, mm. and I kind of rejigged myself, got my finger out, got fit again. So I was a really good runner, and that was probably in the autumn. Got back in the team and never looked back for eight years. So, so yeah, that, we all have those stupid times, and it's very easy to criticise the England boys now are doing stupid things. But mm. when you're young, you are. Stupid. Yeah, I, mean, I, I was, feel was stupid. I'm not stupid now. I'm 61. I, I I'm not stupid. But when I was 20, and me and Ross were winning digs together, and you know we want to find a girlfriend, and we want to have a drink, and we want to maybe go and put a bet on, and that you do stupid things. Yeah, and we all did, and we all do, and. I, I do feel a bit sorry for even the Harry Maguire situation. I know that he's obviously in his mid to, mid twenties now, but you know you want you want to experience all parts of life, don't you? When you're young and you know, and I, I do feel like sometimes living in that goldfish bowl that we're asking these young people to live in, even from the age of like as you said, fourteen, fifteen. Now, if you want to be a professional, you have to do it like this. You want to be a professional, you got to take it seriously. You can't go out. You can't do this. You can't do that. And I, I can't imagine how difficult that is, really, because I certainly didn't do any of that when I was their age. Obviously, I, I work with, I work with the, a lot of the England teams, the younger teams, and I worked with the 17s for about three years. We won the Euros. It was unbelievable. My first year was like Raheem Sterling was in that team and Nick Powell and the John Lundstroms. Oh, God, Nathan Redmond, a, a good team. We got to the semis of the Euros. A couple of years later, we won it. We won the Euros with Joe Gomez was a skipper and uh, Adam Armstrong. Um, yeah. A, a really a fantastic team <coughs> won it in Malta and that and then lads as children was at 16 you can already see the pressure on them to do well at the club and they're going into big contracts and stuff like that I see it now with the lads at Emerson and that and you know this kind of narrative that if you go in every day if you give it everything you've got if you live eat sleep football you never drink you only eat lettuce leaves drink protein drinks if you're first in the gym and last out the gym, you will be a footballer. It's not true, mate, because mm. I see loads of lads at Everton doing that every day. And most of them now aren't at clubs or, or drop down two or three divisions. So it's a lovely narrative. And we can all give an example of player A. He was the first in the gym. James Milner. I don't know. I, I don't know that guy. Actually, I shouldn't mention him, but. You name these players, are oh, unbelievable pro, first in the gym, last out, and that's why he's where he is today. Yeah, I, I get that. But for him, there's nine players who work as hard and try as hard, and they're first in the gym. But we've kind of created this narrative that to do well, you've got to live like a monk. And there is a truth to it, but there's loads of people living like monks and still not doing very well. No. And by the time they get fizzle out at 21, 22, they've kind of had no childhood either. You know, so it's not all as it's painted when we have that narrative of give everything you've got and you'll get there. People always do. They don't, unfortunately. So take us back then to that promotion season. A lot of Rovers fans will still like think fondly of that team that got promoted under Howard Kendall. Was that, as you, you said about Rovers kind of being more than a club to you, was that team 
when you look back now, kind of more than a team to you? Was that your first taste of real success? It was, but you know, that scene started terribly. I was out drinking every night. I weren't in the team. Howard Kennel was under loads of pressure. We played Grimsby away. I played in that game. Duncan McKenzie scored. They had about 100 shots. We had one. We won 1 0. We should have got beat 6 0. We took off on a run then that took us to that unbelievable night in Berry. And, I, you know, I've been so lucky, mate. I've had so many highs. I say with the England teams, won the Euros twice. And with Everton, we finished fourth. Once got the FA Cup final with Manu on pens. I've been so lucky, mate. But that night at Berry, we were a goal down, weren't we? It was a Tuesday night. And then we got two goals. And when that final whistle went, mm-hmm. and it was probably 7,000 on, probably 5,000 Rovers fans. And we went up there. My, my, was she my, my wife and my girlfriend was there. And Garnsey's his girlfriend. And some of the pictures now, lads who sadly aren't with us anymore. And that night, we all went back to the ball's head. It was a pub in them yeah. days, you know. Oh, my God, what a night. What a week. No wonder we got beat the next... T- we, that weren't the last game. That was the last but one game. Berry actually... Amazingly... It must have been a rearranged game. We played Berry twice the last two games, and that beat us at home. It did matter, and it was like weeks of celebrations. Went up to the went up to the next level. Howard, blimey, nearly took us into the top division the year after that. For me, though, it was when Bob Saxton came. I was now married at twenty twenty one, settled down, loving living in the town. It was the Bob Saxton years that really gave me that ingrained feel because I played my best football then in my early 20s under um, under um, Bob oh. Saxton and that's when we kept the team together for many many years yeah. and that same team you can almost name now that those guys and Sally we've lost a few of them you know I've been to too many funerals over the last five years and memorials and stuff but that team was somewhat special and those guys who I see now and again like Faz and round and about and that and keep in touch with them and bump into them. Sadly, at funerals, you know, but that was something special we had there and clubs don't have that now and uh, it, it is different, obviously, you know, we earned the money that dictated. We we, we, we lived in Blackburn, you know, I, I love Blackburn, I love living in Blackburn now. I couldn't afford to live in Wilmslow. I couldn't afford to live out, I don't know, in Harrogate and travel into Blackburn, like, you know, so I lived in um, Pletgate as all the players live around. So that brings that feeling of you and the town together many, many times more <coughs> than if I was travelling up from Wilmslow every day and essentially just passing through. Many times now I'll go into Blackburn Town Centre, sit in Costa Coffee mm. and think to myself, I wonder if any Blackburn... I wonder when the last time a current Blackburn Rovers first team player mm. came into Blackburn Town Centre... I remember seeing Dave, David Dunn about 10 years ago, and that's not a criticism of any of the Blackburn Rovers players. When I was at Forest a couple of years ago, we had um, Tendi Deriqua, and he'd been on loan at Burnley. Nice kid. And I said to him, did you stay around there? Did you stay in the Ribble Valley and that? I said, have you, have you been into Blackburn, into Burnley? No, no, no. I lived in Wilms, no. Travelled to the training ground at Paddyham, isn't it? And yeah. that was it. He, he never saw East Lancashire. And players mm-hmm. don't, and that's just the way it is. And that's not a criticism of him or modern players, but that feeling, you know, I, I could play on a Saturday. I was telling some of the lads at Everton the other day; they couldn't believe this. So the final whistle goes at Ewood Park. We had a good side. We've won. So um, I used to take my shin pads off for ten minutes to go, go and pick them up, walk off. We've had a good win. The fans are cheering, we're clapping. I went to the home team dressing room. The first thing you do is take a can from the side. Mm. We're sitting down, socks down, having a can, guards is having a, a fag. And these are good players, Andy. You know, these are, you know, with the greatest respect, you know, Lancashire League players. These are very good professional players. And, you know, I'll often say to the players, at Everton, I'm out on the grass room every day, I'll maybe flamboyantly whip one in from the corner straight into the net. And I'll say, please don't tell me the players of my era weren't as good as the players today. And I'll still join in training and be good at 60, like, you know, and, you know, so I'm not having all that stuff. But we'd be sat there, all cans, guys having a fag, into the big bath, singing. We used to get £60 a point. So in them days, it was 180 for a win. No, it was two points. It was two points. So it was 60 a point, 120 a win, 60 for going top. A couple of times we'd done them three things in the same day. 
And we sat there, and in the voice of Sid Waddell, as the cans were going down, 180! <laughs> the cans are going down, Garza's has got his flag, and somebody knock his flag into the water, and you go out, so we'd have to get another one. <laughs> we're, going, we're going to the 100 Club then, mate, and then we're on it. We'd bang a few down there, like, you know. And the 100 Club members were waiting. There's a guy called Joe Eccles, and he was a farmer in the Ribble Valley, and he was in there, and I'd go straight over to him and he'd give me my rating and performance on the game. Oh. He'd hand me a pint first. He'd go, oh, I thought you were great today, Bass. I thought you were brilliant. It was a great performance. Some of them were on to you. were fantastic. Cheers. I'll drink my pint. Some days you might say, oh, you're off it today, Baz. You're off it today. The pint was still there, though. That's yeah. the main thing. But we won, drew and lost as a town and a team and that. Mm. Nowadays, it will be incredible to see any beer anywhere. Mm-hmm. in any environment probably for the right reasons we drank too much it was wrong if I was a player today I would drink very very little I'm not saying it was the right thing to do but it was a different time it was a different era but it created an environment that was second to none and will and can never be repeated then we got in the 100 club we had no kids in them days so a few pints in there jump in our cars out to the Ribble Valley uh, uh, the three fishes at Mitten or whatever, or down to the Shireburn, or out to Hurst Green and that, and then just a real good drink with your best friends in great company, having one, get up the next day, no cool downs, no recovery, Jesus Christ, we didn't have to drive 30 miles to an exercise bike, and get a protein shake, R9 RTA, bite in the hand that feeds me, no pun intended, mm-hmm. So we go to the millstone, me and wife, have a couple of pints and some food. And, <clears throat> and that was my recovery. And then go again on Monday. The best times ever. And, and these are, because you lived in the town, you were accountable. So I always did my best anyway. And on Sunday, I'd get up, take Max, my long-haired Alsatian, and Julie, my long-haired wife, take them down the park. <laughs> and, you know, and people would say, well played yesterday. Or, oh, what happened? People would people always ask at the time on a what happened? Well, we got beat two 0 You were there. You saw the set goal was my fault. That's a rhetorical question. Or the biggest thing was Andy, and people have been asking it for years. When he used to park my car back in the eighties at Little Wembley and walk up to be a few autograph hunters, everybody say the same the same time on a question to which I didn't have the answer. Are we going to win today? Yeah. <laughs> and even oh, when I was a physio, oh. when I was a physio at Everton, I get there really early, twelve o'clock. And I drive and I park up and I walk down to Goodison, walk to the players' entrance, and there'll always be a few fans. We're going to win today, Matt. I think, well, I don't know, do I? We don't know if we're going to win today. <laughs> I don't know why you're going to put that on. <laughs> what was I saying? I, I used to tell my dog sometimes in Corporation Park, and the groundsman there, he knew what mark he got and how you'd played. And he would jump out from behind the shrubs and he'd, and he'd give you your mark. Five. You got five. <laughs> and I didn't like that because I didn't want to know. Uh-huh. So I stopped going to Corporation Park for a period. But the point the point being, Andy, because you lived in the town, you were part of that town, you were invested in the town and the public, mm-hmm. you were accountable and happy to be accountable. But the point also, there's so much money in the game now, the fans resent the players more because when I had a bad game, oh, Baz was SHIT. But never mind, he's only on £200 a week and he... He goes in the pub. He's a good guy, actually, but he's not a very good footballer. There wasn't that kind of level of hate stroke envy. Mm. Nowadays, with social media whipping up as well, there's always that feeling of, did you see that chance he misses? Under grand away, did you see that? How can you miss that when you're on that money? But you haven't got your money out on the pitch with you, have you? It's still a game of football. And I noted that. And I noted today, because there's that not that kind of friendly access to the players, the distance and that, the kind of criticism is more vitriolic. And there is an element of the money involved as well and the money people are paying to watch it. Mm. So it's brought that extra dimension of kind of vitriol. So do you, obviously, I will come back to Rovers again later, but just picking up on that point there, obviously you've worked with a hell of a lot of players in what I would like to call the inner sanctum. Like everyone always says within the game, the physios room, kind of what happens in the physios room stays in the physios room. But so you will kind of get to know these players really well, I would imagine. Do you really see, well. do you see now that this pressure does tell on them and that, you know, do, do they actually care that the fans are saying these things about them? Does it, does it weigh heavily on them? 
Yes, it does. I, I remember at Forest a couple of years ago, we'd started, I did a year at Forest, I loved it there, I lived in a flat. It, I went because Dave Weir asked me to go and Mark Wolves was a manager. It was absolutely amazing. I had a flat overlook of the cricket ground right by our training ground, right by the stadium. Yeah, it was. I could see the guy bowling from my balcony. It was an unbelievable experience for me to be away from. I could only go for one year, like you know. But um, we had a goalkeeper. Were you going to say it's a great experience to be away from the wife there for a second? No, no. <laughs> she's been very supportive. She's always saying to me. Why didn't you get a job maybe in Australia or something? So yeah, yeah. I wouldn't criticise her. <laughs> but one day I was doing some soft tissue work on one of the players and he hadn't been playing very well. He was getting some stick. And in the face panel, <coughs> I noticed he was on his phone and I took his phone off him and he's reading Twitter. And everything he was reading was criticism. It was him. He's not good enough. He's let us down. He's got to go. He's a joke. He's a disgrace. He's a clown. And I took the phone and I threw it to the side of the room. I said, son, I'll tell you now. If you're going to make it in football and you're going to do well, you've got to stop doing that because that will torture you. And I know the players are distant and I know the players are millionaires, but they do really care. And they're all working class guys who just have to be really good at football. Mm. The money that's in the game isn't their fault. It's not their fault that if you're a top Premier League player, you earn that kind of money. You're not going to say, actually, no, give me a tenth of that, are you? But... <clears throat> I think it has distanced the players in many ways geographically and maybe in the hearts and minds of the supporters. But these lads who I see and, and work with and that, they're just ordinary lads. And I went back in in the summer for a couple of weeks in Project Restart with the first team. I haven't worked with Everton first team for 10 years. And it was fantastic. And we had like Andre, I did some work with Andre Gomes and Yerry Mina and uh, Fabian Delph and that. And they're just like the guys who are at Halifax. They want to win. They want to play well. They don't want to be injured. They want to have a laugh. They want to enjoy a coffee. They want all the same as all the lads in League Two and below do. They're only the same people. They're just a lot better at football. They've been given this kind of bizarre wealth and now they live distantly and it's distant in the hearts and minds of the fans. So the answer to your question is, of course they care. They want to be popular and that. They want to play well. You know, all these players in it for the money and they don't care and that. Mate, I've seen some incredible bus stops at pro clubs that would show you how much they do care and it does matter to the players because they all grew up supporting clubs and, you know, you might be a millionaire, but your dad's probably still got a sin ticket from where you came from, you know. So it's not like that. Yeah. You've gone on to it there, so we might as well move on to kind of how you became... Well, a really, you know, important cog in Everton's success and also Preston as well. We can't forget Preston North End. You, you did you play there as you went there as a player as well, didn't you, at Preston after leaving Blackburn? Yep. And so yep. how did that all come about the end of your time at Blackburn going into Preston and then you you travel into outside of the playing area, as it were? Yeah, well I've done eight years at Blackburn. Don <coughs> came, all members final. I was left out for that, which is fine. Chris Sully played. That made me decide to leave. That's not being a baby. I thought, it's time to leave now. You've had eight years. You could turn your contract down. It was very early freedom of contract. It wasn't Bosman. You can't leave for nothing where you can say no and go to a tribunal. I didn't want to move house. And Preston were interested. How is that for ambition? Didn't mm. want to move house. So it had to be Preston. Went to Preston. But he went to a tribunal. Very, very difficult at Lancaster. No, at Lytham St. Anne's. So on the one side, you've got the Blackburn people, Bill Fox, Don Mackay. He's a great player. We love him. He's this, he's that. 100 grand. Then you've got John McGrath and the Preston chairman saying he's gone, he's 30, uh, he's past his best, he's worth 20 grand. No, 10 grand or something like, you know. So you're kind of stuck in the middle of that. They're not speaking to each other. It's really difficult. And you go into the tribunal in them days and they ask you what you think you're worth. <laughs> so you want to you want to go for cheap, don't you? You want to mm-hmm. go for as little as possible. Then the pressure's relatively less when you go to the Preston fans. Yeah, it is crap, but he only costs five grand. So I said something like five grand. <laughs> anyway, then you're sent outside. And I went and sat in the um, Preston, um, Keith Leeming's jag. And Keith Leeming and McGrath and Don Mackay and Bill Fox, they're arguing the case, 100 or 5, whatever it's going to be like, you know. Anyway, an hour passes and I'm thinking, oh, please don't be too expensive. I don't have to carry the burden of, like, big money, like, you know. And then they get in the car and they didn't say anything. And then Keith Leeming turned to Bill, uh, John McGrath and went, oh, well, John, he said, it's a guy. He goes, oh, well, John, he said, you can't win them all. <laughs> and then John McGrath turned to me and goes, 
20 grand. That's the most <laughs> I've ever paid for a player. You better effing well perform, mate. Uh, and that's what it's like in the days. I loved it at Preston. It was AstroTurf. I had four great years there. Got quite a few injuries, um, fractures, all through tackles and stuff like that. Got to about 32. Had a bad knee. Uh, got released, <clears throat> which is fair. Not an issue with that. I hadn't played for months because of my knee and that. Could have gone to other clubs, but I was 32, 33 now. You need to move on. You're probably better trying to restart your life stroke career at 32 and 36. Um, <coughs> too late to be a doctor. Uh, it's not cost effective mm. training a 33 year old to be a doctor. Did you, so that's what you seriously doctor. considered. You wanted to go back and do that. Yeah, yeah that's what I wanted to do. I was at school, and that was too late now. But incredibly, and all my life's been dictated to by extreme coincidence and fate and stuff. The PFA instigated a course to get ex-pros to be chartered players, uh, chartered physios. You needed quite a lot of O levels to go to get on the course at Salford University. I made it. I got on. Um, became a chartered physio um, and, and never looked back. Um, and I think God. You know the funny thing about it? That weekend, my brother came up for the weekend and I was telling myself I'd been offered a chance to go on the, to university on this course with a chart physio, but I'm not doing it. He said, do it, Mick. I said, I'm not doing it, Martin. He said, I'm begging you, please do it. Do it for me. I said, no, I, I'm not going to college, university 33. He goes, I'm begging you, please do it for me. I said, I'll give it a go. I did it. And every time I go to... Don't want to be big time here, Chicago or New York who's, or Sydney or La Manga or Wembley or God, I've been everywhere, mate, everywhere around the world, business class with football. I'm so lucky. I think of my brother, I think, my God, I could never thank you enough for that. Mm. So I went why, back to Why Preston. do you think he was so adamant? Did he see? Because what, what... he was really clever at school, but didn't go down the academic route. In 1979, what percentage of people do you think went to university? Yeah, no, like 10, 10%. Like it is, two, well, 2%. Two percent, 50% go now. I went to a grammar school in Birmingham. I got the highest marks in the top stream. Mm. In that year, A1 in the grammar school, 30 extremely clever kids, two went to university. People didn't go to university. No. And Martin has had a great life, been successful, great family man, lovely family. He, he's done several jobs. He, he's a dustman for years and stuff, and, and he's a great guy and that. Very successful because success for me is being happy and honest and good and that. So one of the most successful guys I know. But he knew the the academic routes the way forward and that like. So went there, did a couple of years at Halifax as well. Um, then I ended up at Preston. Preston were now in the bottom division. I got the job there. David Moyes was player coach in them days um, they were in the bottom division but Baxi had bought them, put a lot of money into the club and the rest is history, we had seven fantastic years there, me and Dave and Gary Peters at first, then Dave took up the baton as, as well and then me and Dave went to Everton in 2002, we had eight amazing years there so I've been really I used to say I was lucky but mm. we had this guy called Del Mo he used to trim the toenails at uh, Preston and he'd say, Baz, Baz, another Irish accent. No, I haven't done Irish. He says, Baz, he said, don't keep saying you're lucky. You're fortunate. You've had the opportunity, but by God, you've worked seven days a week for that opportunity. So I've been fortunate, not lucky. Lucky's winning the lottery. I've been fortunate. I worked so hard seven days a week. And when I was at Halifax, I was at university from one till nine, two days a week, Tuesday, Thursday. I spent all summer in hospitals doing the hospital work. No holidays for four years, seven days a week. So I've not been lucky and I've worked really, really hard to get where I am. But then, as I say, me and Dave went to Everton. And uh, it was really funny because... So what year was this now at Everton? We, we, we've now had seven great years at Preston. We've gone from the bottom division... Almost Bolton, to the Premier League. Yeah, Bolton beat us at the Millennium Stadium in yeah. 2000, I think, 2001. We had seven great years. When me and Dave would have a few drinks at Everton, like, you know, and we had great times at Everton. We had some great wins and we had a top four. We had the FA Cup final. We had some great times there at Everton. And when, and that's some club, by the way. What, what a club that is. But me and Dave would have a pint. And we'd always talk back about the first days at Everton. We went to the Isle of Man and me and Dave shared a room. We had to lug all the kit to the top of this guest house. And Gary Peters was the manager. 
you know, that kind of breeding ground to make you the people you are today. And mm. I was a physio, but I played every resi game. And Dave played every first team game, but was manager of the resi. So he managed me in the reserves. And I was a physio and player. I used to put the strappings on, then go out and play the same game and that. Mm. And we'd have a few drinks and that. And we'd always, if I went met him now, we had a drink. We'd always, go, I, just, I went to uh, Real Sochi down, had a couple of days over there five or six years ago. Five, yeah, five or six years ago, we had a few drinks, some tapas, and it was fantastic. And it always goes back to them days at Preston, the early days, and putting the nets up, and Gary Peters was the manager, and Dave was my boss in the reserves, and winning the league. And then he, he won the league one for us a, a, a two years later. And that trip back from Cambridge, we stopped at every pub, mate. There's about 600 of them. And you can imagine what it was like coming back from that, that game, having just won League One. And mm. Dave was always going to be a top manager. You could smell the success. You could smell the aura about him and that. And uh, I remember once Gary Parkinson, the, the lad who tragically had the stroke many years ago, Gary said to me, hang on to Moyes, stick with Moisey. I said, do you think he's that good? And he went, yeah, yeah, he's going to the very, very top and you need to get go with him and that. Mm. And uh, I took his advice. Yeah. And it was funny because... When he went to Everton, he, he went for a couple of months and he, he went for the last couple of games of the 2001-2002 season, kept him up. And his parting words, he, he called me to his office at, at um, Deepdale, because Bowers, Everton being on, I'm going now. Um, Kel and, and Jimmy are taking over here. I'm, I'm coming back for you, Bowers, in the summer, but I'm going. And he was obviously all over the place in terms of, wow, I'm going, excited. And yeah. it was his destiny to go to the top anyway. And uh, he, he drove off from that. But I weren't that bothered because I loved it at Preston. I, I'm autonomous. Um, I've got my own department. There's only me anyway. I'm seven miles from home. They let me do some private work at night to supplement my wages. I don't know if you could have ever been as happy anywhere in any job. I played for the club. The club was flying. They really looked after me and that. So I weren't even that bothered. And I had this kind of worry inside me that the way I did my job with all the running and the extreme hard work and me joining in, I thought, I don't see the Premier League lads buying into that. Yeah. Anyway, in, in the summer, Dave got back in touch with me and he said, I want you to come and that like, you know. And uh, he said, come to my house, we'll discuss the terms. But I didn't really want to go. Uh, um, I, would, I wasn't going to turn it down because that's your fate to go higher and higher as you will one day. You said you've got your new job and stuff. And you want to be at the best at, at the top of that. But for the first time in my life, I'm going to ask for big money because as a player, I got what I was given. At Blackburn, it was a £20 pay rise. And we'd finished fourth, third. Bill Fox had come in, £20 pay rise, £20 pay rise. And that. I'll tell you an interesting story about that. One year, it was the same £20 pay rise. It might have been the year we finished third. Well done, lads. You had a great year. It's £20 pay rise. And we had a meeting at the um, Clog and Billycock with Fars and Keels and Colin Randley in them days. And we decided, no, 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 the 20, no, no, player power, early 80s. Oh, my God, I was, I was frightened to death. No, Bill Fox is going to go mad on Bob Saxton. So we went in, Faz and Parks, and then went in and went, no. They were like, seriously, no, to your £20 rise, isn't that? So, right. And we all sat in the dressing room. We sit, we're staying in the dressing room. It's no. So we're all sat in the home team dressing room. Bob Saxon comes and said, right, Bill Fox is coming down. <laughs> oh, my God. It was confrontation, but I was frightened to death. Anyway, the door flies open. Bill Fox comes in, and he's got one of his workers. He had a fruit and veg business. He's got a worker with him. He's got about 48 cans of Stella. Puts it on the floor. Bill Fox goes, lads, he goes, we're not messing around here. The job's effed. We ain't got any money. There are no pay rises. You take your 20s cost of livings. I bought you some beer. Get stuck into the beers. That's what I think, yeah. Bought you some beers. And we went, okay. <laughs> that was it. It was done. So player power, early 80s style, was done with like two trays of Stella Hardware <laughs> and a few stern words from Bill. No agents, nothing else. So anyway, <coughs> I'm on route to Boise's house. And I was on, I think, 40 grand a year. I thought, I'm, I'm, I, oh my God, I'm asking for double. I don't give a shh. I'm asking for double. So I get there. I've not seen Dave a couple of weeks. Big hug, saw Pam. Lovely people. Lo lovely, lovely people. Big Dave's little Dave, as I call his lad. Big Dave's little Dave was there. And he was only about eight, and I think. And Lauren was about eight. And Pam, lovely hugs. Nice cup of coffee. 
Well, she goes, I need you to come, Baz. What do you want? I thought, right, I'm <laughs> effing doing it now. I don't give a shh. I'm doing it. I'm doing it. Because if I don't do it now, you'll never do it. Right? I said, right, Dave, I'm on 40 grand a year now. I want double. He looked at me. And I want uh, I want a, a nice car, like an E-Class Merc. And I want to be in the bonus as well. No problem. Settle then. See you in the morning. I thought, oh, my God. I could have asked some more. <laughs> you anyway, have trouble. Yeah. So I went outside. I thought, okay. I had the anxiety about going up that level because I thought the players might not like my aggressive, hard-running style of training because I was a fitness fanatic and obsessed with weights and running and running up hills and down hills and across flat bits. So I weren't sure they were going to buy it. And Big Bri, the kitman, who's my best friend, he said to me, oh, Baz, he goes, I've heard they're horrible the players at Everton. And all the players at pressed him. It's nice they wanted me to stay. They were saying, oh, Baz, we've heard horror stories about Big mm. Donk. He just hates physios. We've heard horror stories about what the lads are like. So I've gone over. I've got my massive pay rise. Now. I'm now rich, but destined to fail. So... I drive over a week later and I'm really scared, mate. I'm thinking, oh my God, because the players have spooked me by saying, oh, big dunk hates physios yeah. and the players. So, yeah, so I drive into Belfield. It's the old training ground. It was a really hot day. So it was probably August 2002. And I sat in my car, I was shaking, my hands were sweaty. But I thought, no, this is for my wife and kids. This is for, this is for my family doing it. So I got out of the car and straightened up and walked across the car park into the reception at Belfield. It was a really hot day. I had some denims on and like a yellow check shirt and a denim jacket. Different denims, not the same <laughs> denim, you know, a light Double and a dark. I look, wow. No, no, but carried it off because it was light no. and dark. Okay. Carried it off. Carried yeah, off. don't. Anyway, I opened the door and I've stood in the foyer and I'm, oh, I think, oh my God, I'm just, I'm just stood there like, you know, I then hear this big booming voice. By the way, have you clocked the new physio? It's Bob the effing builder. <laughs> and then I hear loads of laughter. Then the door swings up like a saloon bar. It's Big Dunk in his training gear. And he walks up towards me. He goes, by the way, I'm Big Dunk. And I've finished a few physios. Kenny. <laughs> He's jabbing me in the chest. And I goes, <laughs> I'm back to new physio. Uh, I'll finish a few players' careers, mate. <laughs> and he puts his face in my face. He goes, brilliant. We're going to be pals. <laughs> and I say, well, that's just as well because you spend the season in the medical room, don't you? <laughs> Come back to me again, face to face. He goes, I like you. And then he disappeared. And then that's Kevin that. Campbell came out and he goes, oh, Baz, he goes, I'm Kev Campbell. I knew that, obviously. He goes, yeah. I'm Kev Campbell. I'm the club skipper. Everyone's heard loads about it. We're really excited about it coming to work for us. Welcome to Everton. I was in and it was, oh my God, it was magic. I went out with the injured players, did loads of running and that and come back in. And then in the afternoon when everyone had gone home, I went on the running machine in the gym and did a 10K and that. And I'll never forget this moment, this seminal moment in my life. And there's a big mirror and I'm on the running machine. I've got Everton kit on, Everton badge, MR on it, like, you know, and I'm running, I'm looking at myself in the mirror with that, and I think, oh my God, I don't believe it. I'm an Everton head of the medical department. So my cup runneth over. We had eight unbelievable years there, Andy, honestly. And then um, parting of the ways, I've just written another book. It's coming out soon. It's, I think it's better than the first. It's, oh, it's fantastic, mate. And it tells all about what happened between me and Dave at the end, really, which I didn't really go into the first book. And me and Dave are still close friends. I'm yeah. the biggest fan. He's just the best. I'm so pleased he's got a chance at West Ham now because you've got to give people a chance to turn it around. He's a great man, but you can't do it in nine months at Man U and a year at Real Sociedad and in an impossible chance at Sunderland. You've got to give somebody a chance, a budget at this level and a couple of years and he'll be great and he'll rebuild West Ham like he did and get the hunger back at Everton and that. But that essentially is a story up to 2010 when me and Dave kind of parted company as friends and that. Since then, I've worked for, oh my God, loads of clubs. And I've tried to be sporadic and have a year in, a year there, like, you know. And uh, it, it's worked because as you get older, 
you, you can pick and choose a little bit more. I did my year at Forest. I did a few months at Wigan. I went to Blackpool for a couple of months, and it was amazing. You meet all new people, different environment, different circumstances. And there's an element of you as well. You want to meet new people. Most important thing, A, will they laugh at my jokes? That's yeah. the most important thing. Yeah. B, will they impress by my running and gym ability? That's secondly important. C, can they get any of the buggers fit? That's of a third importance, really. Yeah, number one, will they laugh at my jokes? B, will they be amazed at my fitness? C, can I get them fit? So that's how I've kind of rolled. Is that how you would negotiate with all the clubs that you go to? Is that is that you yeah. what you start? Yeah. yeah. When, when I went down to meet Mark Warburton, it's really funny because I finished at Wigan and then you think that's it now, I'm 59, I'm done, I won't work in football again. And I was sat in Marbella with my wife and my wife had to put it with a lot in terms of me being away a lot, especially with the England teams and that. And, you know, I said, this is it now, we we'll grow all together gracefully and that and I won't go away again. <laughs> and the phone rings and it's David Weir. She goes, Baz, Baz, would you come to Forest as head physio with me and Mark Warburton. And I said, yeah, <laughs> like that. Put the phone down. Anyway, Julie, it's going to be another year. I've just been off the job. And, and she knows what I like. She knows I need to work and you need to be yeah. stimulated and stuff. So the point is, Andy, one minute you're swinging out of the San Miguel on the beach in Marbella, thinking, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? Next news, you're Googling flats in Nottingham. Yeah. So I went there for a year. That would be in Marbella. <laughs> but the point is, Andy, you walk into Nottingham, I'm nearly 60 now, and you want to A. So I went down to meet Mark Walton. He laughed at all my jokes, so I'll do the job. Yeah. Yeah. And then a week later, I go into the training ground. So going on the first day, the guy on reception goes, are you here to fix the showers? Because I'm very aware now, I'm an old guy. No, I'm not. I'm here to win the cross countries in pre-season training. You go going to see the lads. You've been to so many clubs now, it's just... You know, another day, another dollar, new faces, shipped in the night, same band. It's the same, but you're proud to put on the forest shirt, two stars on it, two European mm-hmm. Cup wins. Yeah, so I'm excited and proud to be there. And you walk in the dressing room, and I see Ben Osborne, who did some England work with, and I see Tyler Walk did England work with. Danny Fox is there. Oh my God. I didn't know Danny was here. When I was at Everson all them years ago, um, Danny was only 18, he was a left back like I was. So I'd take him out after training. We'd do some shot holes, then run a length of the pitch, do some shot holes, run a length back to recreate overlapping back and that, like, you know, we were laughing about that a lifetime ago. So you see all these people that you know and that, like, so I try to work at lots of different clubs and I, I, I've, I've done that and it's really exciting and stimulating. And <clears throat> just when you think you're done, so I finished at Forest and we played at Bolton the last game of the season. They beat us and stayed up. It was an unbelievable game. I was buzzing for Bolton, really, because even though I worked for Forest, my friends were the, the physios at Bolton and Forest was safe anyway. And that was it. And you metaphorically throw your boots away again and you think you're never working for a club again. Then, a couple of months later, a guy called Willie Donachy phones me up because will you come and work for this international team that I'm manager of in the Caribbean? You, you won't have heard of it. It's called Montserrat. I said, I know all about Montserrat, uh, the pop stewards in the 80s, the the, uh, the volcano. So I went and did four games in the international breaks for the lowest ranked team. All the lads play in the National League, mainly in England. We won three of the four games. It was unbelievable. We beat Belize. We only lost to El Salvador on the 96th minute, 2 1. And we got to go to Curacao, which is off the coast of Venezuela. We got to go to the Cayman. We played two. You have to fly to Antigua and get a ferry across to Montserrat. So even then, just when you think it can't get any better, you get this. And then I come back. I think that's it now. And then Everton phone it because the, the under 20 physio is leaving. Do you fancy coming till the end of the season? I said, yeah, I will. Then the end of the season comes and I want to, that, that's me. I've done six months. I'm 60 now. I've done it. I've done 60. You know, I'm my 60th birthday. Ran around the pitch in 60 seconds. Done mm-hmm. 60 pass-ups. That was my ambition. And then we're in La Manga. So I, Undy's, Undy's the manager now. I was his physio. Now he's my manager. So Undy's having his breakfast in La Manga. So I go in and say, Dave, you got a minute? Well, yeah, he's eating his breakfast. It was about eight. There's only Undy there getting up early having his breakfast. The lads hadn't come in. I said, Dave, I'm leaving in a month. I, I'm 60 like. He goes, F off, Baz. Kelly's on eating. I said, Dave, seriously, I've given my month's notice now. I'm leaving in a month. He goes, yeah, F off, Baz. And then I goes, no, Dave, seriously, um, I, I'm 60, blah, 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 blah. He goes, Baz, I'll tell you one last time. F off, you're going nowhere. 
So I went outside and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to stay. So I stayed <laughs> in the uh, and, and then at the end of that scene, I thought, that's me now. But then when Everton were good enough to pay us for like five months for being on, um, being off work and that, I thought, I can't leave now. I owe it to the club. So I went back in. So I'm still there now. And there you are. Yeah. And that's it. And, and that's where we are now. That brings that's us up to today. That brings us right up to date. And there's yeah. a new book coming out. I do have some questions that I really need to ask you. Um, yeah, some some guys have been in touch. Um, so I'll start with this one. Um, you said you had a good relationship with the fans, uh, Blackburn. Um, Gordon Dean says, do you remember a suitcase falling on your leg when you were on a train travelling to a home game? It was in the early 80s and we were coming back from a family holiday and the case fell off the top luggage shelf and landed on his leg. My dad couldn't have apologised more if he tried. God, I, I don't remember that, Andy. If that had been at Birmingham, I wish it would have broken my leg. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, Mick Carson wants to know, do you still get called Basil? All the time. Nobody ever calls me Mick. That's my nom de guerre. Nobody would even know me as Mick now. We have a lot of confusion sometimes when I see MR on my shirt. and uh, say, why are you Baz and that? Like, you know, so I have to explain it to like, especially when like um, Carlo's people are lovely Italian guys and they say, Porky Baz. Porky. Yeah, and I have to explain to them. But they'd never heard of Sherlock Holmes. So. Sherlock Holmes, yeah. It's funny, that, isn't it? That, that kind of came at Rovers, and that's quite a big part of your life as well. Um, it's it's going to give me a whole new identity almost, like an yeah. alter ego that has loads of confidence and he's up for everything. And, and then when that goes, you shrink back to being Mickey. <laughs> <laughs> I should have been calling you Baz. Sorry, I just didn't think it was uh, it would have been over familiar to call you Baz, but obviously everyone does. So, um, Craig Fairbrother asks, um, who was the best? A lot of people have asked that. Who's the best player you played with at Rovers? And also, he asks, I don't know why this is important, but who was the hardest player in your time at Ewood? Simon Garner was fantastic and my best mate. We used to room together like he was a great close friend of mine. Still, of course, the absolute yeah, highest goal scorer at Rovers. A legend. On my first day, 9th March 1979, the manager said, Pess! And me and Garns grabbed each other and we're in separate ever since. Every Friday night on a away go, game, he, 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 bless him, he'd be lying there. We've had a couple of cans each and that, and he's having his final fag before lights out and that, and he'd be dropping off on the other bed. I could see him now, and I'd go over and take his fag out of his fingers, put it out so he didn't burn the hotel down, and put him to sleep. Garns was a top player, by the way opponents, well, I used to think, you know, they all seem to do well against me, but there's a player called Peter Barnes who played for Man City. He was fantastic. I used to find it really hard playing against him. He was a terrific player. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Hardest player? Like the like the toughest, I guess? Oh, you want me to say Glenn Keeley, don't you? I don't. I, he he might. was tough, weren't he? Yeah. yeah well, yeah. He was uh, a tough leg. Someone was saying, like, that's a lot of people's favourite Blackburn back four is yourself, Faz, Keels and Brannigan. Jim Brannigan. Yeah, and Teddy Eagle. That is unbelievable. That holds some record. That It's it's incredible. And I say to lads now, I think we play like 200 games together the same back four. Yeah, crazy. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Could never happen again, could it? Well, no, I don't think so. Like, you like to think you've got a settled team, but that's that's taken yeah. to extremes, that, isn't it? Um <laughs> So actually, you mentioned Simon Garner. Tony Ewood Rover on Twitter asks how you kept kept pace with Simon Garner at the Ace of Spades Club on a Saturday night. The Ace, I don't know that the Ace of Spades. That must be after my time. That no, in, in was... Time was my first year in the seventies, late seventies. The Cav. No, very first it was the Beechwood when I met my wife. The Beechwood, and then on to the New Inns and the Load Star. Sometimes there you Early go. Early nights. Those, those were the big ones. Um, yeah. And John Lee, he was the person who kind of requested you to come on here. So thank you, John. Um, he's at Brisbane Rover on Twitter, listens in from Australia. So um, he, he says you've played alongside some of football's finest centre-backs. So he wants to know, A, what makes a great centre-half and who was the best you played with at Rovers? You probably can't I thought Faz was fantastic. And you know what Faz was good at? I called him the Kaiser. He thought it was because he was like Beckenbauer, but it was some of the antics in the beer keller one night in Morecambe. Anyway, he th but he thought it was because he was like Beckenbauer. Yeah. I probably exposed, that, that, that's, he probably didn't even know that, Kaiser. He loved that because he was like Beckenbauer, but it was <laughs> the beer keller. 
and then this dancing on the tables in the beer keller in Morecambe in 1979. But he was fantastic for us. And you know what? He was the worst player ever in training. Was he? He'd, he'd stand out there at Pleasanton and but oh, on match day he bought his A game. Read the game well. Very brave. Very tough. Quick. Faz was a terrific centre half. Interestingly, um, I've been to Brisbane because a, a guy called John Lowy, who, who tragically only died nine months ago, and I went to, he, he, I went and said a few words. Met Mandy, his, his wife at Bolt Stadium. I can't remember six, six eight months ago, and he, you know, he, he was one of my best friends, John. We were very, very close, and he went to live in Australia and um, played for Brisbane Lions when they were in the National League probably in the late 80s and that. So I've been to Brisbane. It's a fantastic city. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I've, I've never been to Brisbane. I've been to Sydney. And yeah. Been, been in all around New Zealand and Canada and stuff. But yeah. I'll, be... tell, you, I'll tell you an example of how lucky I've been in football. Yeah. So Tim Kale, Tim Kale broke his foot. So he yeah. wanted to have an operation in Sydney. So in May, one year, I went over to Sydney on my own business class. It was autumn, obviously, over there. Business class all the way to see Tim. I had a couple of days, went to his house, run up the beach with him and that. And then a year later, same thing happened. I went back a year later. So I had two great visits to Australia, business class, all paid for by Everton and that. Tim showed me Manly Beach and we had a couple of nights out. I've been so lucky, mate. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, thankfully, you've been lucky through this kind of current issues that we're having in this country. Um, you said about obviously your family all thankfully being healthy and also you know um, being able to provide for for themselves. Um, obviously, not so many people. I think a lot of people look to Rovers now as kind of a, a salvation for the difficulties that people are going through. And it's going to be as soon as we can get back into Ewood, you know yeah. that that will really help. Do you still obviously you live in the town? Do you still look at the club and? You know, look for the results and and, and how do you think how do you think we're doing now? And can you see us hopefully getting promotion back into the big time soon? I I care very much about Blackburn Rovers. I would like to go and work there one day. Probably um, that that ship sailed now. Sixty two plus. I I've got a great job at Everton. That would be my dream. I know Tony Moby's a fantastic guy. Um, I think the club are doing fantastically well. I've got to say this, and people might not like to hear it, the Venkis have stuck by the club. Um, I think he's built a really good young squad. I know Joe Rothwell from when I worked at Man U, when I worked at the England teams. I know Ben Brederton from when I was at uh, with the England teams. And I knew Ben, I was at Forest with Ben as well. Ben's going to be a real good player. And I think I said about a year ago, he's finding it hard. He's still only 20. He's carrying that six million quite heavily. But Ben's going to be a decent player for you. I work with Adam Armstrong as well. So I know quite a few of the Blackburn lads. Uh, I know Tony a little bit, and I think he's got it really going there. And let's be honest, you know, every year a Blackpool can go up, a Blackburn can go up, you know, um, anybody can go up on a given year. But let's not forget that championship's really, really tough. And you look at the crowds of some of the clubs and the spending power. You know, I don't want to be negative about the Blackmans and the Prestons and stuff like that and the Wigans who I work for. I loved it there as well. But, you know, and I'm not saying you should try and just stay in that success, but for them teams last seem to comfortably finish in the middle and at restart, Blackman and Preston have real chances of playoff. I think that's an incredible season. Let's not lose sight of that and let's not be disappointed if Blackman only finish seventh or eighth, you know, because you look at the teams in that division now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we, we were actually speaking on, on transfer deadline day. Uh, deadline is in 20 minutes. I know that Blackburn have had a very busy day. Um, so let's hope that those players that they've managed to bring in um, add us some even more impetus and we can we can have some kind of um, promotion challenge. You know, I'm not one of those who thinks the Premier League is the be-all and end-all by any stretch of the imagination. Well, I, I watch by some player at Rochdale. I watch him every week now and I play <coughs> Last season and the season before, I'd go to quite a few home games, some of the away games when I weren't working. Even when I was down in Forest, I went to see him play at Doncaster. So we watch a lot of League One football. That is one hell of a football club, Rochdale. It's mm. run fantastically well. The people are so friendly. They've got a good side. That's tough League One as well. You've got Sunderland, Portsmouth, Hull. Tough, tough, tough. That's a terrific club. So we watch a lot of League One football. It's fantastic. 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm going to have to leave it there. I've got to go and pick my own kids up now. I mentioned of uh, <laughs> Ollie there. I've got to go and get them from the grandparents' house. And uh, they can't bring themselves on. They're only two and three. So, right. It's been a pleasure, absolute pleasure speaking to you, Baz. I'll call you Baz for the first time now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I feel like I know you enough after 70 minutes of chat, but thank you so much for taking your time um, this afternoon to speak to us. And hopefully, you know, we'll see uh, some of you down Ewood as well uh, if we ever get back there and around the town. So thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. I've really enjoyed it. I would always try and, uh, you know, if God, God, God knows if anybody finds what I'm saying interesting, if they do, then I would always be happy to speak. And if a couple of older Blackman fans have had their, I don't know, their memory lane twins this afternoon. Yes. It's all been worthwhile, hasn't it, mate? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I should probably plug, well, I'm not going to plug your book because uh, it plugs itself because it's that good. But the smell yeah. of football, you said there's a new one coming out soon. So maybe we'll have another chat then and you can tell us yeah, a little bit more about in the that. Summer, the smell of football too. Yeah, absolutely. The smell of football yeah. too as well. Yeah, yeah. that's 10 years. It's really good, but... I didn't come on here to plug my book. <laughs> no, but I've done it for you. All right, thank you very much, Baz, and I'll, I'll speak to you again soon. See you later, pal. See you Bye. Later. The Rovers Chat YouTube channel is proudly sponsored by SixYardsOut.com. They've got retro football from every era with mugs, phone cases, and much more. They also have plenty of Rovers goods, including apparel with the famous 94-95 season and this season's kit. Check them out using the link in the description below. So we lose.